Do you know how many satellites are currently orbiting the Earth? It's thousands. 6,542, to be exact. My favorite satellite goes by the name Landsat 8. It completes 40 trips around the planet every day, from about 700 kilometers above the ground. Here where it's been today. This morning it flew from Cape Horn to Greenland in less than half an hour. And right now, it's on its way to the North Pole. What does it do up there? It takes pictures, a lot of them, in incredible detail. You may not know it, but you've seen Lancet work before in Google Earth. And today, I'm going to show you some of the highlights of its recent travel. So here is a satellite view of a football game in the favelas of Sao Paulo. This is a swirl of algae in the Baltic Sea. This is the frozen surface of Lake Baikal, the deepest lake in the world. The rippling dunes of the Namib Desert. and the flood in Botswana's Okavango Delta, which pans a source of grain across the desert. I am especially fascinated by pictures from Africa because I grew up there. First in Gabon, when I was very little, as you can see. <laughs> and when I was seven, my parents moved from France to Niger a country in the Sahel Desert. We arrived in August, during the raining season. Days after days, it was pouring water. <laughs> in the suburb of Niamey, the capital, temporary rivers were forming and disappearing on a daily basis. They were called wadis. So my parents had sold me the desert, but I was surrounded by water. <laughs> so that was the continuous show I was witnessing until mid-September, to be replaced by heat and drought until mid-June. And from time to time, we had experts coming to the French Nigerian Cultural Center. And I remember that one day, Arun Taziaf told us that the Sahel and the Sahara were both Greenlands 8,000 years ago. I couldn't believe it. But indeed, we could see evidence of former rivers. One of them is now a crocodile swamp. That was in the 80s, yeah. <laughs> so I grew up wanting to understand how to engineer the environment so that uh, humankind do not have to undergo natural hazards. Later, I did a PhD on my favorite topic, rainfall, at Imperial in London, <laughs> investigating the significance of the spatial structure of rainfall and its representation for flood runoff estimation. And we found that to model adequately the peak flow, we need a good representation of the total volume of water falling over an area, as well as the rainfall temporal hourly profile. And this is especially true for highly variable convective events, such as summer thunderstorms. So later, after focusing on the hazard, I wanted to better understand the risk, which is a combination of the hazard and the vulnerability of the underlying exposure. So now, at SCORE, as a catastrophe risk manager, I use catastrophe models to quantify the risk due to natural perils, 
with special attention to extremes. So traditionally, the reentry industry was focusing on single events from peak perils, such as Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Otoku earthquake in 2011. So such events were very rare and very violent and could hit the capital of a reinsurer. However, recent storms have raised awareness that several medium-sized events could hit the tail when aggregated together or impact reinsurers' earning volatility. And those storms had wet characteristics. We have a very topical example with Ida. So last week, Ida passed away New Orleans as a Category 4 hurricane and moved towards New York as a simple tropical rainstorm. But although the storm intensity was less, the damages over New York were high. We saw dramatic pictures of the underground being flooded, with people trapped into it. Um, New York Airport was flooded. I mean, even the roof of the US Open could not sustain the weight of the water. But this can be perceived as far away. In mid-July, a new storm called Bunt was announced over Germany. This was not a thousand miles away. This was taking place close. And we started realizing that the event would be significant. I remember weather alerts, a news bulletin that kept popping up into my computer. The team was asked to pause to start post-loss event estimates. And the event was huge for the region. You know, the storm dropped as much as 15 centimeters of rainfall in less than 24 hours. Satellite pictures were dramatical, but ground pictures were even more striking. So we saw images of swelling streams washing away houses and cars and triggering massive landslides. So this torrential rainfall led to significant flooding with lost estimates that are still growing as of today. So we see evidence that the climate is changing. Latest IPCC release as of last August mentions that the impact of climate change on the water cycle is intensifying. We expect 7% more moisture in the atmosphere for every one degree increase in temperature. This translates into more intense rainfall and associated flooded, as well as more intense drought in many regions. In addition, climate change is affecting the rainfall pattern. So incorporating climate change into a modeling means ensuring that models are calibrated to reflect current climate with allowance for near-term trends. So at SCORE, a framework has been designed to assess the impact of climate change on the SCORE loss portfolio potential for a near horizon of 5 to 10 years. With the R&D team, we reviewed the literature to anticipate future trends for various perils, China flood, European wind and hail, North Atlantic hurricanes, wildfires. For European flood, partnerships with CAD vendor models providers, as well as academia, are currently on this way to challenge our current view of the risk. So, we continuously work on integrating climate change, as we know that the time for adaptation and preparation is now. Thank you. <laughs>